Hi everyone, my name is Romain Trousset and I'm an animal nutritionist. But I'm also the owner of Amigo Pet Food, a brand of exclusive pet food made in Mosso Bay in South Africa. Today, we're going to talk about what you can see on the packaging of dog food. There are five analyses that are mandatory to mention for pet food manufacturers on the labels, of which protein is a very important one. Why? Because a lot of the public pays a lot of attention to the level of protein. Well, in a nutshell, I first want to explain to you what is protein and why it is an important nutrient for dogs, because there's no question about that. But secondly, I also want to explain to you the difference between the type of quality of protein and why protein, according to me, is not a very accurate measurement of pet food quality. I want to keep it plain and simple so everybody can understand what I'm talking about. And next time you look at the labeling of pet food, you can better understand what you're looking at. First of all, what is protein? It's one of the three main groups of nutrients, together with fats and carbohydrates. There is a strong focus on protein because this is seen as a very important constituent of muscles, and this is true. But also at the cellular level, in many, many processes, proteins play a particular role. Enzymes, for instance, are proteins. DNA, for instance, is made of protein. The cell structure, skeleton, what holds the body together, is often made of protein. So the requirements of protein for dogs, depending on age, vary quite a lot. A puppy, indeed, is going to need a lot of protein because it needs to build that muscle mass, build that skeleton. But an adult is also going to need a lot of protein to maintain these cells, maintain these muscles, renew and repair them all the time. What is also very interesting though is that dogs, unlike humans, are very good at using protein as a source of energy. So if a dog food contains a lot of protein and actually way above the dog's requirement from a maintenance perspective if it's an adult or from a growth perspective if it's a puppy. While dogs have the ability to turn these proteins into sources of energy, namely glucose, via a process which is called neoglucogenesis. This is a bit of a barbaric term and I will put more information about it in the comments for you. Basically neoglucogenesis is the ability of dogs to turn proteins into glucose. So a protein now becomes a sugar. In other words, a protein becomes a source of energy and dogs can use that. For that reason, if dogs are fed only protein and no carbohydrates or no fat, they still have a way to convert these proteins into energy to sustain their energy requirements. This is a very versatile way to use nutrients and therefore it's very difficult to put dogs in a situation where protein will be in excess. However, it doesn't mean that the more protein the better, not at all. So proteins take many shapes. I just want to give you a short inventory of where you find protein in food, in ingredients. You find protein in meat, for instance, in animal sources, but you also find protein in a lot of vegetal plants. For instance, lentils, peas, and pulses in general contain a high level of protein. And this is why in grain-free food, where you always find a lot of lentils and peas, the protein level is always higher. Not because the animal protein contribution is so much higher than that, but really the rest of the ingredient is bulking up the protein to a very high level. But let's come back to the definition of protein if you like. As I mentioned before, protein is like the building blocks of many tissues and at the cellular level itself it is a very important component but there are thousands and thousands of different types of proteins what is very important to understand is that they are made of the same building blocks there are 22 types of amino acids these are the building blocks that makes the protein really to keep it simple imagine you have a variety of 22 different types of bricks and with this you can build any structure, any shape. Well, these are your amino acids and they make a protein. What is very important in the protein shapes and functionality is really the 3D structure. An enzyme, for instance, which is a complex protein, 
is like a key to a lock. You can imagine if you damage the 3D shape of that enzyme, it's like hitting a key with a hammer. It's not going to be able to open that lock anymore. Well, that enzyme, if it's three-dimensional structure, is damaged by heat, by processing, by digestion, for instance, it's not going to have its full set of functionalities. If you like to illustrate, you can also compare amino acids to the alphabet. And in the alphabet, there are letters that are less important in our language than others. For instance, if you take out the Z, or if you take out the X, you can still write a lot of sentences and a lot of words and make sense, right? But now imagine if you take out the vowels, then it's a lot more difficult for sentences to be written. And those vowels in the world of amino acids, they are the essential amino acids. There are 10 essential amino acids for dogs, which dogs cannot make themselves. They need to acquire this from nutrition. So from a nutritional perspective, protein is a little bit irrelevant as a concept as a whole. What is more important is the makeup of the protein. What are these proteins made of? And particularly, what is the level of essential amino acids that we find in those proteins? But it doesn't end here. It would be too simple. These essential amino acids, the real question is how bioavailable are they? How digestible are they so that what you find in the food ingredient can be absorbed by the dog's body. And that's what I call the bioreleverance of a certain ingredient for pet nutrition. It needs to have a certain level of all the essential amino acids, but also these must be highly bioavailable, highly digestible by the dogs, so that they can sustain the dog's metabolism without being restrictive. This is very important. So the next question is very simple. Why is the legislation in South Africa only making it compulsory to display the protein level and not the amino acid levels or not the essential amino acid levels? Well, in the background, it is compulsory to respect a certain level of each of those 10 essential amino acids. However, it would be much too complicated to display those 10 different amino acids on the label and really the labels would become flooded with information that would be very confusing for the public. So, the law says you must only display the amount of protein. To my opinion, this is not sufficient either. The question is, first of all, where is the protein coming from? Secondly, what is the digestibility of that protein? And as I mentioned before, what is the level of these essential amino acids? And that you can't really see by just looking at the level of protein. I'll give you an example. For instance, if you compare the level of protein found in feathers or in wool to the level of protein found in meat, well, you'll be surprised to hear that feathers and wool are much higher protein content than what you find in meat. This is interesting, isn't it? So for pet food manufacturers to save cost, this is very tempting to include sources of protein that are not digestible, that are just helping to push the levels of protein in food. But this does nothing to your dog in terms of nutrition, nothing at all. What I'm simply trying to say here is the level of protein, how high is the protein in a pet food and particularly on the pet food label, is completely relevant to quality. This is not a good criteria to judge quality. What one must understand is where the protein is coming from, what is the proportion between animal protein and vegetal protein, and also what is the level of essential amino acids. You don't see that on a label. This is as simple as this. So why is it such an important parameter then? Why does the law make it compulsory to feature on the label of your dog food? Because this is quite simple to analyze. Well, in fact, not protein itself, but an element which is present in all protein at a rate which is quite consistent called nitrogen. Nitrogen is the core of all protein and actually this is the reason why there's such a high requirement for protein and amino acids in general, because nitrogen is an essential nutrient for life. And actually, this is what your pets need in the proteins themselves, a source of nitrogen. So nitrogen is very easily analyzed by labs, and this is quite a cheap analysis. And by working out a ratio, guessing or estimating, I would say, 
the average level of nitrogen, which is fine in protein in the vegetal and animal world, labs get to an estimation of the protein content. This is an estimation because if there are contaminants that are bringing nitrogen not under the form of protein, also called non-proteic nitrogen, this would dummy the analysis and artificially push up the level of protein that is apparent in the food. If you remember, a couple of years ago, there was a huge scandal where there was melamine found in baby's milk powder in China. Well, melamine is a non-proteic source of nitrogen. And by mixing it with milk powder, it artificially pushed up the level of protein. The problem is melamine is not digestible neither by babies or dogs and that caused a lot of fatalities. Well, for that reason, for instance, we check systematically at Amigo Pet Food the full amino acid profile of all the protein sources that we use, just to make sure it corresponds to what we expect and what we know from our fixed sources and supplies. So in a nutshell, when you look at the composition on the label of pet food, and particularly the guaranteed analysis, don't take protein as the only criteria to evaluate quality. This is very misleading.